It's my privilege to introduce our first speaker then, Father Don Sr. Father Don Sr. has always been a happy fellow, but he's especially so today as he is in his last remaining days of service as president of Catholic Theological Union in Chicago. We are fortunate to have him here with us as he has many requests to speak at engagements such as this one. As you can tell from the program, Father Senior is an accomplished scripture scholar. He is a member of the Passionate Congregation and has been ordained a priest since 1967. He received his doctorate in New Testament studies from the University of Louvain in Belgium in 1972. He is currently a consultant to the Committee on Divine Worship which nicely complements his strong scriptural background for the purposes of this seminar. Father Senior will speak to us this morning on the Word of God, source and, sour, source and power of preaching. Please help me welcome Father Don Senior. to everyone. It's really a, an honor and a pleasure to be with you, uh, especially with you who are so central to the church's mission of proclaiming the word of God to the world. Um, I just drove down from Chicago this morning, so I, I hope I'm alert and ready to go <laughs> to be with you all. As you know, the recent statement of the National Conference of Catholic Bishops preaching the mystery of faith is a strong reaffirmation of the ministry of the word, particularly in the context of the Sunday Eucharist. It follows upon a previous statement on preaching issued by the Bishop's Committee on Priestly Life and Ministry some 30 years ago, fulfilled in your hearing. A text that has served the church well over the past few years, and I'm sure that many of you have used it in your homiletic courses. <clears throat> but a lot has happened to the church in the United States in the past 30 years, and the time was ripe for the bishops to turn their attention once more to this central mystery of the church, ministry of the church. As our program indicates, subsequent sessions in our conference will focus on some of the dimensions of the statement that reflect this new context, namely the relationship of preaching to the new evangelization and the necessary link between homiletic preaching and the church's catechetical mission. The topic I've been asked to speak on today is to focus on the biblical foundations for the church's preaching ministry and some of the conclusions we might draw from this for what could be called a, a spirituality of preaching. I'll do my best to address this topic, but I also look forward very much to your responses and insights, uh, my brothers and sisters in the preaching ministry. One of the most remarkable features of the post-Vatican II Church regarding our reflection on the Word of God is the strong and consistent mode of reflection on what is the ultimate foundation for the Church's mission to proclaim the Word of God. One can draw, in fact, a straight line <laughs> from the dogmatic constitution on divine revelation, De Verbum, formulated near the very end of the Second Vatican Council in November 1965. Through the formulation of the Catechism of the Catholic Church in 1992 in its reflection on the creed, which in fact draws heavily on De Verbum, and on to Pope Benedict's post-synodal exhortation of 2010, Verbum Domini, and finally, to the U.S. Bishop's statement, Preaching the Mystery of Faith, promulgated at their last November meeting. This latter text, which is the rationale for our conference this year, draws on all of the above mentioned documents in reflecting on the church's preaching ministry. There is a common pattern that runs through each of these documents. The formulation found in Vatican II's De Verbum is seminal for them all. You may recall that this document underwent a complex and controversial process before it was finally approved by the Council Fathers. The original schema proposed at the opening session of the Council was rejected as being too abstract, too scholastic, and too rigid in its formalization. Then apparatus for the German bishops at the Council 
Joseph Ratzinger said that the schema was cramped and essentially a canonization of Roman school theology, end quote. Pope John XXIII, characteristically, sought a solution to the sharp divisions among the Council Fathers by appointing a commission to work on the text, a commission co-chaired by Cardinal Ottaviani and Cardinal Bea, each of whom represented polar opposite viewpoints about the documents. It would be great to get the minutes of their meetings. But. Uh, ultimately, the document, benefiting from the educational and formative process of the Council's intervening sessions, would be approved by a near unanimous vote right towards the end of the Council. The fundamentals of each of the subsequent statements I've referred to are already found in this Council's dogmatic constitution. First and foremost, the God revealed in the Bible is a God who self-communicates, a God who is not self-contained, but one who wishes to reveal himself to the world. This is evident in the account of creation that begins the biblical saga in Genesis chapter 1. Through his all-powerful word, God creates the universe in all of its dimensions and in all of its beauty. Above all, God creates the human being, male and female, as the summit of creation and establishes a relationship with humans. Secondly, the second step in a way in this schema, the Bible portrays the human person, male and female, as made in the divine image, therefore as capable, indeed destined, to respond to God. Thus, revelation is not thought of as an abstract notion about the transmission of truth as such, but at its root is a relationship between God and the world he created. This relational nature of revelation is fundamental to the whole theology of the word developed in day variable and continuing to the present day. Thirdly, the God who creates the universe and the human being does not stay aloof from his creation, but is involved, although mysteriously, in human history. The long and tortured saga of Israel presented in subsequent biblical history reflects this conviction. God is present, protecting Israel, admonishing it, forgiving it, carrying forward often in spite of itself. Although the main focus of the Bible is on God's unique people, Israel, it is also clear within the scriptures themselves that the God of Israel is also the God of the nations. In the entire history of all peoples and of the universe itself is God's own arena. Fourth, the culmination of human history and of the real revealing word of God comes in the person of Jesus Christ, the word made flesh and the definitive revealer of God's word to the world. Here, Dei Verbum, and followed by each of the subsequent documents I have cited, turns to the prologue of John's gospel as the most eloquent biblical expression of this conviction. The word who is with God from the beginning is the word spoken by God and perfectly expressing God's being so that the word is God. This is the word that arcs down into the created world and becomes flesh. In the flesh of Jesus Christ, the community sees the glory of God in John's terms. Other key texts cited in our documents that also express this fundamental conviction about Jesus, the word, are found, for example, in the opening words of the epistle to the Hebrews. In times past, God spoke in partial and various ways to our ancestors through the prophets. In these last days, he spoke to us through a son, whom he made heir of all things, and through whom he created the universe, who is the refulgence of his glory, the very imprint of his being, and who sustains all things by his mighty word. Or the opening lines of the letter to the Ephesians, also cited by Dei Verbum. In all wisdom and insight, God has made known to us the mystery of his will in accord with his favor that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of times to sum up all things in Christ in heaven and on earth. And finally, in this schema, or outline of the theology, the word in these documents, 
Finally, there's the assertion that the word embodied and made flesh in Jesus Christ, a word expressed in his teaching and compassionate healing, in his gathering of a community, in his giving of life and the fullness of love, in his conquering of death and his return to communion with the Father for all time. This full articulation of God's word of redeeming love for the world is now entrusted to the apostles and their successors. Fired by the Spirit of God sent upon the church by the risen and triumphant Christ, the apostolic church is commissioned to proclaim the word of God to the world. And in the spirit of that word, to form communities of life gathered in the name of Jesus and destined to be witnesses of God's redeeming love for the world. Here is the ultimate source and authority for the preaching ministry of the church. This is the sequence from the first impulse of creation through the incarnation and on to the apostolic mission of the church that is first articulated in Dei Verbum, succinctly repeated in the Catechism, beautifully expanded upon in Pope Benedict's eloquent Verbum Domini, which taking its cue from the General Synod of 2008, reflects on the role of scripture in the life and ministry of the church. And this is the same biblical and doctrinal basis for the bishop's statement on preaching the mystery of faith. We should not be content, however, to articulate the biblical foundation for the ministry of preaching in rather abstract or schematic terms. When we actually reflect on the word of God as presented by the scriptures themselves, we are taken deep into the pulsating beauty and power of our biblical heritage and deep into the underlying meaning of our ministry as preachers of the word within the church. With your patience, I would like for a few moments to look through this biblical lens at the church's mission to proclaim the word of God in the midst of our unusual times. The word of God. Few phrases resonate more powerfully within the biblical saga itself. The motif of God's word twists through the entire story of Israel like a powerful sinew. From the creating word of the opening chapters of Genesis to the healing word of the lamb who was slain in the book of Revelation, the Bible is convinced of the overwhelming and transformative power of God's word to us. At the dawn of the universe, God's word hovers over the tohu vabohu, the formless and chaotic void, and transforms it into light, order, beauty, warmth, the light of the sun by day, the glow of the stars and the moon by night, the fertile earth, and the marvel of the human person, male and female. Astoundingly, the Bible affirms that the human being, male and female, through the power of the word, is made in the image and likeness of God. We are shaped and formed in the deepest level of our being, to be like God, to bear the divine imprint, and to live the divine life, the ultimate goal of God's word. This word of God that shaped the universe and shaped the human heart pushes out into history as the Bible presents it, forging a people and giving them a destiny. God's word has a particularly transformative impact on the leaders and teachers of God's people, ultimately laying the groundwork for the church's mission of preaching. God's word anoints the kings and emboldened the prophets. Moses, who would lead God's people out of slavery and despair, encountering God in the burning bush at the mountain of God. Hesitant and fearful as God anoints him to lead the people out of slavery. O oh, my Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past or even now that you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, who gives speech to mortals? Who makes them mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to speak. Or the call of the prophet Amos of Tekoa, dragooned by God into a powerful mission of justice. I am no prophet, he says, nor a prophet's son. I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. 
And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. And so Amos went. Or Jeremiah, tongue-tied, hesitant, I am only a boy, he tells God. God says, Do not say, I am only a boy. For you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Or consider the prophet Isaiah himself, standing in the portals of the temple, overwhelmed by a sense of God's presence and his own unworthiness, crying out, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Then a seraph purifies his troubled heart and lips with a burning coal from the temple brazier. And then the voice of God penetrates the prophet's dread. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? His anguish put aside, the prophet speaks. Here I am, Lord, send me. And so it would be with all of the great characters who form the biblical saga, men and women, unlikely vessels of God, often hesitant and awkward, yet summoned by God's compelling and all-powerful word to take up their mission on behalf of the people, leading them out of Egypt and slavery, sustaining them in their desert trek, bringing them into the land of promise, purifying them in their failure, comforting them in exile, bringing them back home. The word of God as presented in the scripture, God's call, if we like, is often disruptive, breaking into ordinary lives and asking ordinary people to bear a mission of human transformation and to experience profound and sometimes wrenching change in order to be faithful to the divine summons. Few passages, I think, can match the fierce poetry of Psalm 29 as it hymns this power of the divine word. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over vast waters. The voice of the Lord is mighty. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord shatters the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. The voice of the Lord strikes fiery flames. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips forests bare. And in his temple all say, glory. Or listen to the vivid imagery of the Book of Wisdom and speaking of God's punishment of Pharaoh for resisting the freedom of the people. For when peaceful stillness compassed everything and the night in its swift course was half spent, your all-powerful word from heaven's royal throne bounded a fierce warrior into the doomed land, bearing the sharp sword of your inexorable decree. And as it alighted, it filled every place with death. He still reached to heaven while he stood upon the earth. Or in a different mode, what text is more beautiful? than the famous verse of Isaiah 55, 10 to 11, quoted in Dei Verbum. For just as the heavens, from the heavens, the rain and the snow come down, and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it fertile and fruitful, giving seed to him who sows and bread to him who eats, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but shall do my will achieving the end for which I sent it. The word of God, dynamic, powerful, awesome, filled with startling creativity and power and beauty. This is the sense that Israel had of God's imminent presence in the midst of history. This is the pattern of God's self-disclosure and generous abundance that paves the way for Christian reflection on the mystery of Jesus as God's word incarnate, and indeed as ultimately a revelation of the mystery of the Trinity itself. So deep and penetrating is this biblical metaphor of the word as a way of speaking of God's redemptive presence in the world that in the New Testament, it becomes synonymous as we know with Christ himself 
and with the Christian message. It is John, of course, who makes this point so eloquently in the prologue to his gospel. God speaking at the dawn before time. That word so perfectly articulated that it indeed reveals God fully. That word which is theos, bounding into creation, into the world of civilization, and unfathomably, beautifully, that word becoming flesh, true flesh, truly human. And through the human embodiment of the word, through Jesus, the incarnate word, the glory of God is now revealed. Thus, every gesture of Jesus, every act of compassion, every word he speaks, and even and especially his ultimate giving of life for those whom he loves as friends, reveals the God who speaks as one who will not condemn the world, but is intent that the world might live through him. The same fundamental conviction that Jesus is the embodied word of God also colors the early Christian language used to describe its mission a mission that continued Christ's living presence in the world. The early chapters of Acts, as you know, makes this point in a vivid way. Disciples, broken and despairing, are transformed by their encounter with the living word of the risen Christ. Peter and the Twelve break out of their room of fear and preach the word to the crowds of Jewish pilgrims who come to Jerusalem for Pentecost. Neither threat, nor imprisonment, nor flogging, can stop these apostles and witnesses to the word. Or we can think of the appearance of the two disciples fleeing Jerusalem in despair and sadness, their hopes broken by the death of Jesus. The text reflected upon at length in the bishop's statement. The mysterious pilgrim who joins them breaks open God's word, breaks bread with them, and their hearts burn within them, and then they return to the community in Jerusalem. Or we can think of Paul encountering the risen Christ, his world turned upside down in the dramatic conversation seen on the road to Damascus in the Acts of the Apostles. But later in his letter to the Galatians, this same Paul, perhaps after much reflection, would think of this encounter with the word not as a dramatic singular event, but as a mysterious call that reached him before he was even knit together in his mother's womb, as he says, citing Isaiah, a destiny that God has in store for him from all eternity. In this beautiful reflection in his letter to the Galatians, Paul recapitulates the experience of Isaiah and Jeremiah before him, prophets who realized that the creative power of God's word had chosen them and shaped them from the very beginning even before they saw the light of day. And so we have Paul and the men and women who ranged through the Mediterranean world, Paul and Silas and Barnabas, Timothy and Lydia and Aquila and Priscilla and Phoebe, the deacon of Cancrea and Apollos of Alexandria, inflamed with the Christian message, described their work as the proclamation of the word, as the announcement of good news, as a compulsion to speak the word of God. We think of Paul the apostle, that passionate, driven character that he was. You can sense his bold pastoral plan in Romans 15 and in other passages of his letters. He intended to move around the rim of the Mediterranean world through the power of God's word, planting Christian communities in places no one else had been. Thereby, he says, making Israel jealous and finally, triumphantly, handing over the entire world to Christ, who would then give it to God. Paul thought he could do this within a few months. You know, he was, uh, <laughs> think no small thoughts, you know. For the sake of this mission, Paul, you remember, thinks of himself as compelled to preach the word of God, the word that is Christ. Who can forget this inexorable logic in Romans chapter 10? For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, and reaching all, enriching all who call upon him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him in whom they have not believed? 
And how can they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone to preach? And how can people preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Thus faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the word of Christ. One of the special features of preaching the mystery of faith, the bishop's statement, is that it considers what are the spiritual implications of such a the theology of the word for the one who is called to proclaim that biblical word within the preaching mission of the church. It's a very valuable dimension of the bishop's statement, I think. I won't repeat it, you can read it, of course, but allow me to offer some personal reflections, if you like, on some aspects of what the beauty and power of the scriptures might require of us who are called to preach. First of all, there, there are three of them, so bear with us. You know, it's always dangerous to enumerate because you start to think, my God, he still has two to go. But, uh, <laughs> but first of all, I believe that those who are commissioned to preach from the scriptures should be able to absorb the rhetorical power and the beauty of the biblical language. The term rhetorical I use here is not in the narrow and often pejorative sense that is sometimes used when we say, well, that's just rhetoric or that's political rhetoric. I mean rhetorical in the classical sense, meaning language and forms of discourse capable of moving the human spirit. This is the sense of rhetoric in which most of the New Testament authors themselves would have been schooled. Most of the biblical literature understands the importance of rich symbols, of language that has power and beauty, of imagery that captures the imagination and touches the heart. Jeremiah, for example, envisioning his prophetic vocation to steadfastness as God's fashioning him into a pillar of iron or he says, I am a wall of brass. Well, God's own elusiveness, Jeremiah says, is like a treacherous brook that does not abide. Or Isaiah daring to have God shower contempt on those who trample the courts of the temple, their hands still scarlet with guilt in the first chapter of Isaiah. Or the composer of the lament Psalms who is able to shake a verbal fist at God's absence, demanding to know where God is in the starkness of a night of suffering and isolation, like in Psalm 22. Or the pointed parable of a Nathan about the ewe lamb that stabs to the heart of David's guilt. Or the parables of Jesus, where, for example, in Luke's gospel, he challenges the lack of compassion on the part of the religious leaders in his three extraordinary mercy parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, in Luke chapter 15 or the expansive and indelible Pauline word portrait of charity in 1 Corinthians 13. Who can forget it? Or the author of the second letter of Peter asking his community to wait expectantly until the morning star rises in your hearts. Or the near mad symbolism of Revelation's heavenly vision that fires still the imagination of the artist the prophet and the mystic. Everyone in education today, theological and secular, is aware that despite or maybe because of our prowess in empirical and technological matters, we might be in danger of creating a generation whose language is impoverished. With little exposure to classical literature or the best of modern literature, with only a glancing acquaintance with the Bible itself, even in many theology schools, and being force-fed from an early age with the dull technocratic or even perhaps worse insipid personalistic language of contemporary Western society, the student preacher of today can enter the arena severely hampered. You will all remember Ken Burns' public television series on the American Civil War that first appeared a few years ago and is considered the most watched television program in history. It's frequently rebroadcast and has captivated millions of viewers. 
The power of that series derived in part from the poignancy and epic scope of its subject matter and from the evocative photos of those who participated in the tragedy. But if you remember, it also used to an extraordinary degree the power of language. As viewers listened to love letters, pages from diaries, and speeches by powerful orators such as Abraham Lincoln or Frederick Douglass, they were moved by the rhetorical power of language, much of it, by the way, drawn from the Bible. I fear the few letters from home today and in the age of the phone and email and texting, not many are written, would have similar force or could draw on sort of a semi-conscious reservoir of beauty. Not because people do not have feelings or noble sentiments, but because for many people, even educated ones, the language required to express their deepest conviction fails them. Perhaps in the task of training preachers, which so many of you are involved, it would be wise to spend more time on massive doses of reading and literature, and especially poetry, and especially, of course, spending time in a reflective and powerful, prayerful reading of the Bible itself. The privilege of preaching from the biblical lectionary compels us, I believe, to strive to develop a culture or better a habit of heart of biblical reading, a personal familiarity with the terrain of the biblical literature and biblical history, a passionate love of the biblical text and ready access to it that comes only from thoughtful, habitual, prolonged, thorough, and deeply prayerful reading and rereading of the biblical literature itself. Some of you will be familiar with the name of Father Carol Stu Miller, who was a, a fellow passionist, a, a great biblical scholar, and I'm grateful to say a personal mentor for me. Carol published a series of books entitled Biblical Meditations, and they were on the different seasons of the liturgical year, if you remember. And they're still in print. I have a vivid memory, because I lived in the same community with Carol for many years, of coming into our chapel early each morning and finding Carol already there, Bible in one hand and his notebook in the other, moving from his meditation on the text to proclamation of the word. From those notebooks came those books. Would that all of us who aspire to be preachers of the word had a similar life habit. Secondly, preaching with a biblical character, I think, should be experientially grounded, but not excessively autobiographical and not centered on the preacher. The statement, preaching the mystery of faith, makes this point, and I think it's a good one, as you know. Pope Benedict himself, in Verbum Domini, observed, quote, the homily is a means of bringing the scriptural message to life in a way that helps the faithful to realize that God's word is present and at work in their everyday lives. Consequently, those who have been charged with preaching by virtue of a specific ministry ought to take this task to heart. Generic and abstract homilies which obscure the directness of God's word should be avoided as well as useless digressions, which risk drawing greater attention to the preacher than to the heart of the gospel message." End quote. I might add, this is a big name drop here, that having had the privilege of hearing several Pope Francis homilies during a recent meeting of the Pontifical Biblical Commission in Rome, he is living, as you know, in the same place where these various commissions get housed. He has a room just like everybody else and is at every meal. We also had the chance to be at his daily Eucharist. And I noted his own style of preaching is, is very much in this mode, always biblically centered, rich with imagery, warmly personal and to the point, but never drawing attention to himself. They were really very moving. The Bible itself, I think, also makes this point about the experiential but not so autobiographical. The Bible is a book of the people. It is folk literature, in the main, not high literature. 
The sagas of Genesis and Exodus, the practical legislation of Leviticus, the chronicles of the monarchy, the war stories of the Maccabees, the oracles of the prophets, the aphorisms of Proverbs, the healing stories and parables of the gospel, the sometimes blunt, sometimes poetic letters of Paul, were written by people who lived and felt what they spoke about. The biblical scribes trained for the kingdom drew, indeed, as Matthew's gospel puts it, from their treasure house, from something deep within. This is what gives the biblical materials their credibility, handed on from generation to generation, turned over lovingly in the heart and soul of believers, earnestly prayed and pondered over, the biblical materials reflect the faith experience of those who shape these texts. The scriptures therefore have an inherent capacity to touch the faith of the reader leaping across centuries and across boundaries of culture. The great teachers and pastors of the Bible had an eye for human experience, an appreciation for the real dimensions of the human character. The Bible is seldom sentimental or romantic. For example, recent analysis of the speech patterns of the sayings and discourses and parables of Jesus reveal his strong experiential base. As one New Testament scholar has said, listening to the parables of Jesus is like watching a home movie in which transcendent truth takes on vivid human terms. His parables reveal someone who as storytellers must had a penetrating and compassionate eye for the human drama, with all of its nobility, its crudeness, its suffering, its comedy. For example, the characters that fill the gospel parables are often not ideal types. Along with the noble father who patiently awaits his errant son, and the shepherd who risks everything for one sheep, and the charitable Samaritan who cares for his natural enemy, there is also the crafty steward who feathers his own nest as he faces the prospect of unemployment. The man who answers his door for his supposed friend, only to be able to sleep without interruption. The judge who gives the widow her due, only to get rid of her. And both the son who squanders his inheritance and ends up tending pigs, and his elder brother who resents the too lavish forgiveness of their parent when he welcomes the prodigal home. There, there's so many rogues in Jesus' parables. The appreciative eye for human comedy and human tragedy that characterizes the parables reflects the earth-rooted character of the Bible as a whole. It is in the main not polite, elegant literature. It has the power of genuine human experience of life itself. But at the same time, the author of almost every book of the Bible is anonymous. The focus is not on the storyteller, or on the author. Like most of the artisans of the cathedrals, the biblical authors did not sign their names to their work and often drew attention to someone else as the source of their authority. Paul might seem to be an exception. It's, after all, hard to write a letter and not have some personal reference. But even Paul, with his robust, extroverted nature, used autobiography sparingly and usually in those cases where his apostolic authority was under attack and called for a vigorous personal defense, then Paul can unload. And most of the letters of Paul were not written by himself alone, as he acknowledges. As he frequently states in his opening lines, they were collaborative affairs composed with co-workers. The intensely interpersonal focus of many students of ministry and the bias of our Western culture uh, it can make the self-transcendence of the preacher a challenge, I think. Managing to be personal without riveting attention on oneself is an art and a spiritual discipline that takes learning. Nevertheless, there is a way in which those who proclaim the word can expose their personal convictions and experience without forcing the biblical message to be trimmed to their own dimensions and limited to their own concerns. Preaching, like liturgy itself, is a public communal act. And the scope of the preacher, like the style of the presider, 
must reach beyond the confines of one's own experience to make way for the varying dimensions of those who hear the word through the proclamation of the homily. The very authority of the word, I think, demands this. The preacher mediates the word, and in so doing becomes a kind of sacramental presence, enabling the proclamation to be amplified through one believing person. This means inevitably, I think, that good preaching must be transparent, allowing the hearer to find a truth that is at once communicated in the words and gestures and life example of the preacher, but in fact transcends any individual's horizon. For this reason, as you know well, effective preaching is related to character and spirituality as much or more than it is to technique and method. And finally, final point, preaching with a biblical character, I think, should be expansive, evocative, and visionary, rather than overly didactic or moralistic or trivial. Preaching is, in fact, an expression of this essential missionary character of the church itself. The connection of the Sunday's homily with the church's call to evangelization will be taken up in a subsequent session. But allow me here just to make a brief comment on the nature of the biblical word as we've been trying to reflect on it and the call to mission and its impact on the spirituality of the preacher. If the homily is to match the scope and character of the biblical text and harmonize with the deep seriousness of the liturgy itself, then it should truly inspire and enlarge the Christian heart of the one who hears it. This is the spirit of the church's mission to the world, the call to proclaim the word of God, which is a word not of condemnation, but a word of life, a word embodied and most vividly proclaimed in the person and mission of Jesus, who is the taproot, the wellspring of all Christian ministry, of all sense of mission. When we use the term mission today, of course, we mean it not just in the sense of mission agentes, in the imagery in the, uh, of a missionary leaving home shores and bringing the word of the gospel to those who never heard it. This, of course, remains valid and necessary. But there is also a more pervasive and all-encompassing sense of mission. John Paul II noted that every Christian, quote, has the prophetic task of recalling and serving the divine plan for humanity as it is announced in scripture and as it emerges from an attentive reading of the signs of God's providential action in history. This, he says, is the plan for the salvation and reconciliation of all humanity. Pretty broad agenda. When considering our mission of proclaiming the word of God, no matter what the particular modalities of our ministry might be, we must keep in mind that the object of God's word is the transformation and salvation of the world. When I was in graduate school in Louvain, Belgium many years ago, I took a trip with a few friends to London to buy books, which were much cheaper than there, than on the continent. At Blackwell's famous bookstore in Oxford, I found a table outside the store that contained used books, each being sold for one pound. I was thrilled to discover there a leather-bound edition of J.C. Hawkins' book on the synoptic problem, entitled Horae Synoptice. It was full of graphs and so on. Not exactly bedside reading, for sure, <laughs> but uh, for a half-crazed, eager graduate student, truly a find. And on the ferry on the way back, I pulled out my treasure and saw the original owner had penned an inscription in Greek in the frontispiece. It read, Hoda agros esten ho cosmos. The field is the world. Where was this quote from, I wondered? One of the ancient Greek poets. Only later did I realize, to my great embarrassment, that it was from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verse 38, where Jesus explains the parable of the wheat and the weeds to his disciples. Uh, by the way, I've been working in Matthew's Gospel every day for two years, so this was especially embarrassing. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> the seed of God's word, Jesus says, is 
to the world. The field is the world. The focus of the mission as Jesus presents it is not the church itself, not our domestic disputes and controversies, but the transformation of the world in all its glories and anguish. Remember the most famous quote, I think, from the council, quote, the joys and hopes, the grief and anguish of the people of our time, especially of those who are poor or afflicted in any way, are the joy and hope, the grief and anguish of the followers of Christ. Nothing that is genuinely human fails to find an echo in their hearts, for theirs is a community composed of human beings Human beings who, united in Christ and guided by the Holy Spirit, press onwards towards the kingdom of the Father and are bearers of the message of salvation intended for all peoples. That is why Christians cherish a feeling of deep solidarity with the human race and its history." End quote. And if we are to proclaim the word of God to this world and in this church, we must have empathy for our world. The word of God is always incarnate at a particular time and place. It is not abstract or unchanging. I am struck how in the scriptures themselves, the word of God and the mission to proclaim that word are so woven with human modalities. We often discover the meaning of our mission to the world only in the light of current events. To put it another way, mission is shaped not just by the forceful ideals and dreams revealed in the teachings of the Old and New Testaments and in our tradition, but also by the mysterious stirrings of the spirit alive in the world, shaping and moving among what might seem to be secular or impersonal realities in history. In fact, the entire biblical saga reminds us over and over that the spirit of God is not confined to Israel or even to the church, but roams the world and works through events and people we might never anticipate. This sense of openness to our world and sympathy with its struggles and anguish, even as we are alert to its false values and wary of its seductions, is what the bishop's statement, drawing upon the reflection of Pope John Paul II, who used this term in speaking of the priesthood, says this is what it means to be a person of communion be aloof from our world, to take only a moralizing negative stance toward our world is not the spirit of Christ, nor does it reflect the tenor of the biblical word. I've been struck in recent weeks by the frequent comments of Pope Francis along these lines. I think everybody's waiting to hear what he's going to say next. Maybe, <laughs> maybe some are holding their breath, I don't know. Uh, for the church's face to the world to be only negative and corrective, he says rather than radiating a sense of tenderness and care for our world, for the church to be absorbed only with its own life and concerns and not turn to the world is, as the Pope put it, quote, to risk choking on stale air, and joke. He himself repeatedly uses images of the church as mother, as nourishing, as tender and loving, as reaching out particularly to the most vulnerable. For most of our Catholic brothers and sisters, the face of the church will be most readily and frequently experienced in the words and attitudes projected in the Sunday liturgy and most intensely in the Sunday homily. That's what makes the stakes so high about what we're talking about. The biblical word with which we are entrusted, the biblical word that is the word we proclaim, impels us to open our hearts in compassion and love for our people and for the world where God has placed us, for better or for worse. Imbibing the beauty and power of the biblical word itself, drawing on experience but not putting the focus on ourselves, being charged with the missionary spirit of the biblical word, and have it shape our relationship to our world. These are some of the ways I believe that taking to heart our call to preach the biblical word will affect our spirituality. The bishop's statement concludes with words of encouragement. As priests and people close to the church, we are well aware of its problems. The corrosive and demoralizing effect of the sexual abuse crisis that continu continues to be a burden. The sense of diminishment that shrinking numbers and 
shrinking financial resources inflict on us. The polarities and struggles and discourse of our society that also seem to have an impact on the church. The list can go on, we could all add to it. Some of these things we cannot control even as we struggle to live lives of integrity. Yet there are some things we can control and preaching is one of them. We can give new life to our preaching. We can work harder at our preparation. We can strive in our prayer and study to sink more deeply into the beauty and power of our scriptures. We can impress on ourselves and on our students that the ministry of preaching, particularly in the context of the Sunday Eucharist, is going to be the most important encounter they probably will have with their people. And for our people to realize that that same Sunday homily is probably their most important encounter with the living word of God and with the face of Christ's church. I really think that's true. <laughs> Those moments uh, so the, of connection with all their distractions and all the complexities and awkwardness, uh, this is the moment. The bishops conclude their statement on preaching with the dedication to Mary, the mother of God. They cite the beautiful image of Ephraim and Augustine that Mary first conceived the word in her heart before conceiving the word in her womb. We too, like Mary, the mother of Jesus, the first proclaimer of the word incarnate, can strive to bear Christ in our hearts and in our words for the sake of the world. Thank you very much. <laughs>